Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending my talk. I know there are a lot of great talks in parallel, so I really appreciate uh, you being here. I hope you had a, a great lunch. This talk is about um, AI and incident management and how to use or leverage AI to um, reduce manual work and speed up the resolution process. And, and I'll be talking about um, use cases on how we leverage AI to improve our software. And to tell you a little bit more about us, um, I'm the CEO and um, co-founder of iLert. iLert is a uh, SaaS company, a software company for incident response. And we help companies uh, to reduce um, response times and fast, uh, uh, resolve incidents faster. Uh, we're based in Germany, uh, and companies like Reva, IKEA, um, Air Malta, MSPs use iLert uh, to, um, to increase their uptime and to operate 24-7 services. So we act as a central dispatcher for critical events in a company, and we, we collect um, events from multiple sources and connect those systems that emit those events, like monitoring tools, with the people that are in charge of uh, those systems. So we enable DevOps teams, IT ops teams to do a better uh, job and to improve um, the way they're doing uh, their job. And, and we'll, we'll, we'll get to that in a, in a second. What I would like to talk about today is uh, when we talk about incident management, we, we always, and in particular incident response, we, we like to look at incident response across um, the four different stages. And those are um, preparing for incidents and Preparing for incidents is, is everything about uh, like setting up the right protocols um, just to prepare an organization for things that can happen outside of uh, regular business hours. So things like uh, who is on call? How do we organize on call? Uh, what do I do if my primary responder doesn't respond to uh, an urgent um, um, alert? And then uh, the second stage is um, the response, the actual response. So, as, yeah, so imagine there is something going on uh, that needs immediate human attention. It's 3 a.m. in the morning. Then there are a set of activities that you perform to contain an incident. First, first and foremost, you need to uh, be aware of the incident so you get alerted. And then maybe you start a, you start a uh, dedicated war room channel. You mobilize uh, additional responders, so on and so forth. And in the third stage, um, you, you communicate incidents. Incidents, especially in, in the IT domain, um, they are rarely silo siloed just for the IT department. They affect the entire value chain. So you might have to communicate with your users. You might have to communicate with uh, internal stakeholders within a company. Um, and that's also a critical part of incident response. And last but not least, um, it's the learning from incidents. And there's a like, tactic I'm sure that you are all aware of this is um, like, doing post-mortems, conducting post-mortems. Post-mortems are all about um, like learning from incidents and um, taking action towards um, preventing that same incident from happening again by analyzing the root cause, uh, by, 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 by setting up mechanism uh, in the system architecture, maybe, to prevent such an incident from ever happening again. And, and we've picked one use case per stage, um, how we leverage AI or AI, or, or, or in a broader sense, um, LLM-based um, um, techniques to improve the user experience in our software. And I would like to um, just share how we did it, what are the underlying principles. Maybe you can like, be inspired from that. Uh, maybe you have suggestions on how to improve this. Um, so I'll, 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 I'll be also around after this talk, so feel free to approach me, uh, and then we can have a talk about it. Uh, but it, at, at times, it's going to, it will be, like, from a technical point of view, um, very detailed what I'm going to um, share today. So let's, let's start with um, on-call schedules, using AI assistance for on-call scheduling. So in the preparation phase, you need to set up an on-call schedule, right? And um, there is a user interface for that. Um, and, and we have built purpose-built schedules just for the domain of, uh, of, of, of uh, on-call scheduling for on-call teams within the IT domain. And um, we thought um, this is an area where sometimes new users struggle because 
like the interface is maybe not super intuitive, and we thought, okay, maybe we can come up with a conversational interface um, with the help of, of, of large language models that walks a user through the generation of an on-call schedule. And um, this is, of course, not the same as asking ChatGPT to create a text. At the end, we need a structured output that's capable of doing an API call in our system and that will generate, um, that will generate um, a schedule, right? And um, how are we doing this? Uh, we're, we're, we're just like, having a regular conversation using a chat interface. And the AI uh, has an underlying prompt um, where it says, okay, these are the requirements for a schedule. Ask the user these questions. And then um, we're leveraging OpenAI's function calling capabilities to create a function call or a JSON document that we can use to actually create the schedule. And um, th th this is how the prompt can look like. I mean, that, that's a version of the prompt. And the most important part here is, uh, part here is that it contains of a like, fairly, like, fairly um, elaborative prompt that lists all the requirements and also a function that describes how our API works. So OpenAI is capable of actually performing, uh, creating a JSON document that's capable of calling, making a REST API call. And I would like to um, show you a very simple demo um, how this works. So this is our um, interface for creating a schedule. And instead of actually creating a schedule, I'm going to ask our uh, AI to walk me through the schedule creation process. Let me see if I can make this a little bit bigger. Um, I'll just say, okay, um, create a bi-weekly rotation with myself, Katie, and Andreas. And now um, the assistant is like, understanding uh, my, 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 my input and then trying to just extract what information do I need to go ahead and create the actual schedule. So it asks me for the start date. It's Monday 9. And then um, what are the support hours? Let's say we're 24 seven on call. So there are, there are no on call restrictions. And that's it. Um, so that was a very simple schedule. If I click generate, you can see it has created the schedule according to the specifications that I provided. So it's a bi-weekly schedule. Uh, myself, Katie and Andreas, we rotate on a bi-weekly rotation and we hand over the on-call uh, every uh, Monday at 9 a.m. And it's a 24 seven schedule. Uh, there are even more complex scenarios possible where you have, for example, a follow the sun schedule. You tell our assistant, I, would, I have two sites, I have a team in, in the US, I have a team in, in Europe, and I would like to create a schedule uh, with 24 seven coverage where, um, where incidents are routed uh, to a location where um, there is working times, right? Uh, working hours. That's a more complex scenario, and we, we were observing that that's, uh, like even more complex scenarios are perfectly possible. Although uh, we're, we're still hit by um, Hallucina hallucinations uh, um, like here and there. So sometimes it like, just creates output that's not valid, even though we, we, uh, there is a very dedicated schema uh, how the JSON might look like. So there are challenges here and there. It's for us, it's something we're still exploring. It's, it's a beta feature, but it's one way how we, we, um, we're trying to improve the UX of our uh, software. Let's continue. Um, so the next use case is, and this is a very common problem, is um, to, reduce alert no uh, to reduce alert noise through intelligent grouping. And um, what I mean by that is, um, so whenever there is an incident and you are in firefighting mode, sometimes these monitoring tools, they generate lots of alerts for the same root cause, right? And this is, um, this is a problem because you have, to, you have to review the alerts just to see, okay, is this a new thing or is this um, the same thing that I'm already working on? And this takes time, right? And um, sometimes these, these floodings can happen in the tens, hundreds of alerts. 
And, and we are leveraging um, LLMs to uh, group, to intelligently group alerts based on semantic meaning of the alert. So we're going beyond textual matching and uh, um, trying to detect duplicates. We're using um, LLMs to, to understand the semantics of an alert and then group based on those semantics. And I would like to walk you through how we're doing this. And, and one major difference for this use case is that we cannot call an API from OpenAI, right? Because we're producing, we're, we're consuming events, we're a um, SaaS platform. Uh, we we uh, consume um, millions of events per day, so, so we cannot make uh, an, an external API call for, for, every, for every event. In this case, we're hosting our own um, embeddings model, and I would like to walk you through the different concepts uh, that, are, uh, that are important to understand uh, how this works. So we're using a technique called uh, embedding similarity search for deduplication. Let's, let's unpack the terms uh, for a second. Um, so what we're doing whenever we have a new alert, this alert is transformed into a uh, vector. And a vector is just a numerical representation of that alert. And uh, we're using an embeddings model to, trans to do this transformation, to perform this transformation. And an embedding model is a, is a, a specific type of machine lear learning model that was pre-trained pre for a specific use case. For example, to um, process sentences from a natural language or to process images, right? And um, we have selected, or our team has selected, uh, an open source model available on Hugging Face. We've experimented with different models, and we've selected a general purpose embedding model that was trained on, um, on, 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 on language, on general language. So it's not a, it's not a specific model for um, like alert data or incident data. And it turns out that one performs really well on alert data. And uh, so this embedding model um, will take an input, and um, it can look something like this, a sentence, um, and it will transform it to a series of numbers. By the way, this also happens when you talk to ChatGPT, for example. You make an input, that input is transformed into a vector, and that vector is, um, contains lots of numbers uh, in, the, in the thousands. In our case, we, we have chosen a, um, in, an embedding model that contains, um, I think, a few hundred dimensions. And that vector captures the semantic meaning of that input. So that's um, step number two. Step number one is also we pre-process these alerts to remove anything that is not relevant for the, uh, the task of deduplication. For example, um, like any IDs, uh, timestamps, um, or uh, we, we, we even remove lots of the JSON structure of, of that data and just reduce it to, to those elements that are relevant for the duplication. So alerts are being pre-processed, then um, we, uh, we um, vectorize those alerts, store them in a vector database, a specific database for, that was optimized for storing and uh, processing uh, vectors. In our case, we're using uh, Kudrand, it's, a, it's also a database, a company, software company from, from Germany. We have very good experience with that so far. And um, then comes the deduplication logic. And the deduplication logic is, uh, is implemented by setting a similarity threshold. And what do I mean by similarity? At the end, we're dealing with vectors, with numbers. And uh, you can just calculate um, the, um, the, the mathematical distance from between two vectors. And the closer those two vectors are, the more similar the alerts are being considered, and we're, we're just using a, 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 I believe, a cosine distance function to do this. And we internally set a threshold for when an alert is um, considered to be a duplicate or not. And we also let the user to fine tune this setting. And a very important step is, uh, of course, um, the feedback collection. So we also uh, let our users rate whether this particular grouping was, uh, was correct or not. And I would like to show you again um, a real quick live demo of this. I believe so. This is our interface right now. There are no alerts. And um, I'll use Postman for this. So I have prepared just three sample alerts. And they, they all, um, they sound similar. Um, 
from a textual point of view, they are different, but semantically, the first three ones, they capture the same thing. So it's, it's something about like disk space uh, is, is, is below a certain threshold. And I'll, I'll fire this alert. Of course, in a real scenario, this is, happens like through a monitoring tool, completely automated. And, and we, we see now a, um, in, in a new alert um, was created in iAlert. It was, it's the first alert. And we have set a threshold of five minutes. So for a window of five minutes, for every new event that, that, are, uh, that will come in, we're, we will check whether this is a duplicate or not, whether we have already captured something like this, this uh, before. So the next alerts, I'll change the summary. I'll change the summary to, uh, to uh, I'll essentially submit a new alert. Critical, only 10% of disk space remaining on file server eight. Again, this doesn't create a new alert. It's appended to the same alert uh, because it uses the, uh, the deduplication logic. We can see here it has already uh, grouped two alerts, two events within a single alert. And then um, let's do another one. That one is appended again to the same alert. And just, just to show you that we're not grouping everything, let me uh, submit a different problem that's related to CPU usage. This will create a new alert. So when we here, we can see there is a, a second alert uh, that was created uh, because semantically, this was a different problem. And this works even, even um, like sometimes um, alerts and incidents they, 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 they might sound different. For example, um, let's say you have multiple services running on the same server on the same Kubernetes cluster, and that underlying Kubernetes cluster is having an issue. Of course, all the services, they will fire alerts. But if you have a, a monitoring tool that captures, for example, that, okay, these services run on those, runs on this cluster, it's still able to um, group those alerts and assume, okay, this is because of the same root cause, because they, they, uh, the, uh, there is something wrong with the, with, the, with the cluster, therefore all the services are also affected by this. It's not perfect, but it still helps you to uh, reduce um, being, being flooded uh, with alerts. And um, here, here is a way how we just show our users how this can be fine-tuned. So this is the threshold I was talking about. And if you set the threshold very low, more alerts will be grouped. And if you set it high, um, fewer alerts are grouped. Right, I have 12 more minutes. Um, if you have questions, by the way, feel free uh, to ask them while I'm presenting. If not, let's continue. Okay, uh, first here, over there. Um, uh, we're, we're using an embedding model uh, that was pre-trained from Alibaba. That's a general purpose embedding model. I don't know the exact model right now because we, 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 we've experimented a, few, a little bit, but it's something, um, and, and we looked at factors like, um, like what's the performance of um, making a, uh, like, uh, of, 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 of um, creating a vector for, for a given alert, how many tokens can, can this embedding model uh, process, so on and so forth. But right now it's a model, it's a general purpose model that was trained on uh, language text uh, from Alibaba, yeah. In this case, it was a static priority, it was low. Um, the, the, um, this is not related to AI. The, the, the priority of the alert is um, something where um, we, uh, you can attach different notification behavior to a certain priority. So if, if, it's some, if something is high priority, maybe you want to get a phone call. If something's low priority, um, you can, uh, like a push notification might, m might suffice. But we're, we're not at the stage uh, where we're using AI to um, extract a priority from it. Okay, um, the third use case is to, to use AI for incident communication. And this is probably obvious to, um, to anyone who has been using ChatGPT. Um, <clears throat> so 
an incident or, or when you are fighting an incident, this is sometimes um, a stressful situation, and um, your first priority is to stop the bleeding, right? You want to uh, contain the incident and reduce its business impact. Unless you have a, like a dedicated, um, dedicated role just for communicating with your users, it's something that falls on the burden of the, of the, of the on-call responder. So the, the same person that needs to fix the problem is sometimes also responsible for uh, communicating that same problem. And when you are communicating a problem, um, you also um, need to make sure that you hit the right tone. If you're communicating with external users, um, the, the messaging is professional. It matches your um, like matches the, the 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 company's tone. And um, we think we can we can we can take some of those some of that stress uh, by um, just letting the incident responder just type in what's the problem. And then the AI generates um, like a beautiful incident message. And it goes even beyond that. And I would like to show you um, exactly in a demo what we're doing. Again, uh, I'll, I'll skip the prompt here. Um, so let's say, um, so let's say we're in an incident. This is again the incident creation interface. And our platform is a single platform for alerting incident comms and status pages. And um, Let's say we're, we're having an incident where all the company's payment APIs are slow, are responding slow. And I'll just type in payment APRs, APIs are slow. And I'll, I'll have um, the integrated AI do the rest. And as you can see, it goes beyond just um, drafting a message. First of all, it, it, it crafts a beautiful message. Payment APIs are experiencing slow response times. We are currently investigating an issue where our payment, gate, uh, payment APIs are experiencing slow response times. Our team is working diligently to identify the root cause and restore normal service as quickly as possible. So this, you could say, okay, this I could have easily done just by going to ChatGPT and then quickly saying, okay, uh, can you please uh, create this, uh, um, create an incident message for me? But, but it goes beyond that. Um, it selects, so there, there, there are, there's a service catalog in the application. It selects all the services that are payment related and it also understands that um, slow APIs are not the end of the world. So the, the, the impact of a specific service is, is degraded, but it's not a major outage, right? Um, and, and I think like this is a very obvious use case, but it's, like, it's super helpful uh, because it's integrated in, into the platform and you just like, type in, maybe like, you're not as... Um, as, as good in like, crafting a professional uh, incident message, or you just simply don't want to spend time on it. And um, yeah, we, we, we help you with that uh, just by putting in a small prompt and then we generate the incident message, select all the services, even select the incident status. So if I uh, was to publish an update, say, okay, we've identified the issue, it will select the incident status and maybe uh, change any service status if this was a part of uh, my, my update. So that's um, use case number three, using LLMs to create um, incident messages. And then um, use case number four, using uh, leveraging LLMs to create postmortems. And I feel it, it's almost irresponsible not to leverage uh, LLMs to create postmortems. And, and, and let me let me tell you why. Um, so the, the, the practice uh, or the, the practice of doing postmortems is, uh, as I stated in the beginning, is about learning from incidents and making sure that they don't happen in the future again. And the way um, an incident workflow could look like is, okay, you get page, it's 3 a.m. in the morning, you create situational awareness, then you discover, okay, this is having business impact. That means uh, services are being affected. Then I engage an incident response team, I get help, and then I create a, a chat channel where those members try to fix the incident. They collaborate in the incident. In, in the meantime, the, more data from, from the monitoring tools might come in. And this is like all orchestrate, orchestrated within our platform. So we, our customers use iLerts, of course, to get alerted. We receive all the alerts. Uh, the users also use iLert to, to uh, create a dedicated uh, war room channel to work on the incident. And at some point, um, and 
as you just saw, they also use iAlert to post updates uh, um, about the business impact, uh, so on and so forth. And then at some point, um, hopefully the incident is resolved. And, and now imagine we have all the data, we have the machine generated data, we have the alerts, we have the events, we have um, the data that was discussed in the chat channel. Uh, and the chat channel is a gold mine for postmortems because there it's documented who did what, uh, what actions did we agreed on, um, and, and, and what are we, uh, like what was the business impact, so on and so forth. And um, the way we're leveraging um, all this data is, again, we're providing a very simple interface um, it's, that says generate postmortem, and then it will generate a document that's an 80% finished postmortem that contains, like, the, that extracts all the information based on the input data from the chat channels, from the machine generated data. And it saves you about, like, most of the time. And so you can focus on the actual valuable part of the postmortem creation, which is about, um, like, learning from incidents and then um, brainstorming ideas on how to improve the resiliency of, uh, of the system. And um, I, I'm not going to do a live um, demo because this generation takes a few minutes. Um, but I'll, I would like to show you a, a sample postmortem document that was entirely uh, machine generated by, by the AI from a real incident. Uh, so it will list some key facts, the incident timeline, describe its, describe its impact, very accurate in this case, perform a root cause analysis and also list all the action items that uh, AI was able to extract from the chat channel. Okay, um, we have a few minutes left. I would like to conclude with a few guiding principles on how we uh, think about uh, developing or incorporating AI into the user experience, you know, into our software. So first of all, we, we allow our customers to opt out from AI services that rely on any external provider. The uh, the uh, noise reduction um, 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 use case, we don't rely on any external provider because we, ho we, we host everything in our own data center or in, in, uh, in AWS. And um, to protect our systems from, uh, from common LLM vulnerabilities, we follow a few best practices. For example, um, all operations that are executed as a result of an interaction with, with an LLM are non-destructive. We limit the data um, that we share with an LLM to an absolute minimum and also clearly make it transparent to our customers. And the, the data we share with LLMs is never influenced by the output of the LLM. So whatever we want to share with OpenAI, we share in the initial prompt. So there is no way that subsequent, uh, for example, in the chat interface, that subsequent prompts um, might, uh, lead out, might lead our software to share more data. <clears throat> and um, we have implemented an intermediate layer for LLM observability, where um, we collect a few um, data. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's essentially um, a, a, we collect telemetry data and it's an observability layer where we collect the user inputs, the LLM output, uh, how many tokens were used, tokens are the primary currency for interacting with LLMs and so on and so forth. And based on those, um, we, we um, like improve, um, our models, uh, the models that are being used, um, and so on. And then uh, I would like to share you, with you one, one more thing. We leverage JSON output wherever possible. Um, and there is, oh, there should be one slide res with respect to the model selection strategy. So f for the model selection strategy, we always start with the most powerful model like neglecting cost in the first place. And then uh, we look whether um, there are like, cheaper models or whether even there is a model that we can uh, host on our own and then like improve response times, improve uh, costs. Okay, uh, this concludes my talk. Uh, it's um, 2.20 and I don't want to take time from the next speaker. Um, I'm, I'll be here for questions. If you have any questions, uh, thank you for, again, being here and uh, listening to my talk.